All right. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Um, uh, welcome to our monthly uh, 70 uh, seminar again. Um, I really realize in the US, uh, this is the first day after long weekend, the Labor Day weekend. So, um, you know, thank you uh, for um, coming and joining us. And uh, today our speaker, this month our speaker is uh, Dr. Jeff Dunn from the NIH. Um, we are very excited to, um, to have him here. Um, you know, especially I think, um, you know, lots of people here at Hopkins are close friends with Jeff. And of course, uh, many of us have, fo have been following uh, his work for many years. Um, so uh, uh, as usual, please allow me uh, just a few minutes, a very uh, brief introduction. So uh, Dr. Dunn um, got uh, his uh, PhD uh, training in physics uh, from the University of Delft from uh, the Netherlands. And then after that, uh, he did his postdoc uh, study at UCSF and, uh, and then uh, the NIH. So um, during that time, uh, uh, most of his work has been focused on technology development, especially spectroscopy and the functional MRI and the application of this uh, technology to study uh, human uh, physiology. So Dr. Uh, Dunn joined uh, the NIH, uh, I believe in year 2000. And um, you know, among uh, many amazing work from his group, I think uh, some of his recent work has been focusing on uh, investigating the magnetic properties of brain tissue using high field uh, MR technology. So uh, which will be the topic of today's um, uh, lecture, study of brain ion and the myelin at high magnetic field. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Dr. Dan, uh, looking forward to your amazing uh, presentation uh, lecture as uh, always. Thank you. Yeah, well, thanks for inviting. And uh, it's great to be uh, with old friends and I'm happy to give this talk to you guys. Um, just one um, correction on your introduction. I've been at NIH since 1992, so a little longer than 2000. So I, I got Sorry, tenure in 2000. <laughs> yeah, Let, so let's get started. So this talk is going to be very um, NIH oriented and it's going to be mostly a historic overview of, you know, how we studied uh, brain tissue with MRI and how we looked at the contrast and tried to interpret the contrast. So that's sort of the main focus of this talk. and. Uh, the most references are to our own work because I want to emphasize how we, um, you know, uh, got through this, you know, how, how we were yeah, participating in this field and how we uh, made decisions, uh, you know, in, into our research direction and, 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 um, and studies. So the, the, my talk has four parts. Um, so I first do a general introduction of how we improve sensitivity um, by going to high field and to develop detectors. My lab has spent quite a bit of time on that. Uh, then uh, most of the talk will be regarding the contrast interpretation and manipulation. I show a little bit of pathology, applications to pathology, and then uh, lastly, some maybe some alternative methods to look at iron myelin compared to um, the most used uh, method, which is uh, susceptibility weighted imaging. So I'll we'll start with uh, an introduction of how we improve sensitivity uh, in MRI using detector arrays in high field. So if you wanna improve sensitivity in MRI, you have to realize that a lot of the noise doesn't come from the area that you're looking at or interested in. So in MRI, you want to have localized the signal to a single voxel, but noise is not localized because it's not an NMR resonance phenomenon and you can't change the res resonance frequency by gradients. So gradients are used to, uh, used to localize the NMR signal, but the noise will not be localized. So you get basically noise from the whole object that is seen by the coil. So to improve that, you can make the coil smaller so they look at only the area that you're interested in and ignore sort of the noise from the rest of the, the body. 
and uh, this has uh, this has been the the key principle of, by which uh, SNR has been improved over the years. So very early on, MRI started with cell coils; those were large coils, but they couldn't be used at higher field, so they were very uh, limited to very low field, so 0.1 Tesla and so, and so forth. Then with going to higher field, people uh, couldn't use the cell coil anymore. And they started to realize that uh, very high sensitivity could be obtained with surface coil. That was done in the 1980s. But of course, with surface coils, you're limited to the area that you can look at. So a sort of a compromise, Cecil Hayes uh, introduced the, the uh, birdcage coil in 1985. And that had a reasonable sensitivity, but still captures some of the noise outside of the volume of interest from the neck and the and the shoulders. Then the next uh, step in improvement of the signal to noise ratio came with array coils. In uh, started in 1990 with uh, Peter Rumer applying a four channel array to the heart, because the heart is only a small area of the body that you're interested in, and the body coil captures a lot of signal from outside or noise from outside the heart region. So that was a big improvement, improving the SNR by four fold or so in the heart. And in the brain, uh, this has been applied since around 1998. Uh, one of the first principles was um, done by uh, Graham Wright's group, where he uh, changed the body uh, a volume coil. So he, he took a birdcage coil and then separated all the elements and then was able to improve SNR by reconstructing the signals from the individual elements and doing post-processing post combination of these signals rather than having them electrically summed in the birdcage. And we have also quite been quite active in developing these coils and um, that that started um, in around 2000. So uh, what we did is uh, we wanted to show that you can improve the SNR under the surface coil, but not lose in the center. So basically you gain SNR everywhere in the brain. We had only a four channel system, a G system. But um, what we did is uh, we made a, a two times four channel coil or array uh, where we first plugged in four channels, terminated the other four, and then looked at the other four channels. And then in post-processing, we combined the signals as if it were obtained from an eight-channel coil. And that demonstrated that you can get an increased uh, sensitivity everywhere in the brain. Um, then uh, the next step was to, uh, we, we well, so we were interested in a race and Nova Medical Patrick Ladden had done some array work. Um, and but he wanted to be convinced that SNR was better everywhere before he would step into a head array. But, uh, so we made an agreement to to work on that together. And uh, since then we uh, Nova Medical and has uh, developed quite a few arrays, a lot of testing arrays based on our designs, and then they came up with their own design. Um, and that has uh, gone th from 8 to 24 to 32 channels. And currently, the most clinical coils that you have at 7T for brain imaging are based on this uh, NOVA 32 channel array. Now, you can go further than that. And uh, Larry Walt has wor worked on that. Uh, actually, he started also very early with a wraparound 8 channel array for 7T. Uh, about the same time as we were working at 1.5T. Um, but he, his group has continued this, and uh, they show that going to from 32 to 64 channels, you can still gain in sensitivity. It gets harder and harder to do because you have to be able to decouple the elements to be able to get this sensitivity increase. But uh, using specialized amplifiers, he was able to show that going to 64 channel arrays buys you a little bit extra sensitivity, primarily in the periphery. But one of the bigger gains is uh, with sense acceleration. So if you have multiple coils, you can use the spatial specific 
specificity of the sensitivity profiles to in, improve the imaging process and accelerate it. So a different acceleration acceleration rates, um, you can get improvement uh, if you use a 64 channel array over a 32 channel array because the sensitivity profiles of higher count arrays are more distinct, spatially distinct. So you have more spatial independent information. And you can go further than that, than even that. You, uh, they have recently shown in the 128 channel array, but the gain set gets smaller and smaller, you know, over uh, fewer count uh, systems, and it gets harder and harder to to uh, construct these. So it may be that uh, eventually we'll not have clinical clinical uh, 128 channel coils, but maybe a little bit less or fewer channels, maybe 100 channels or so. That's that's my guesstimate. So you get, a, in summary, for the coils, you get an SNR improvement, partly because of, uh, because you localize the noise by the sensitivity profiles of the coil. You get great sensitivity improvement in the periphery while preserving central SNR and even improving that also over large volume uh, head coils because you pick up less from the shoulders. At, at 70, yeah, the limit I think is around 100 channels as I mentioned. Now in terms of field strength, another way to improve sensitivity is to go to higher field strength. And there has been a dramatic increase since the invention of MRI. So uh, body coils or body systems were initially at 0.05 Tesla and 0.04 Tesla in the early 80s, late late 70s, and currently we're at 70. So that is a many-fold improvement in magnetic field strength. Now, what do, what do you get with increased magnetic field strength? You get increased nuclear polarization that goes linear with the field strength, and that gives that immediately translates in increased sense signal to noise ratio or sensitivity. Uh, so you can get an uh, improved noise suppression because of the focality of the coil sensitivity. So that, uh, that focality increases with field strength a bit. So that is an additional gain. You get a reduced contribution from noise outside the sample. So ideally you wanna, all the noise that you wanna get is from the sample, but also coil conductors and amplifiers contri contribute a little, little bit, but that fraction increases for, for small coils. But at higher fields, uh, sample noise increases, whereas, whereas coil noise, conductor noise, and amplifier noise doesn't. So you, that situation is a little bit improved at high field. You get uh, some supralinear increase with high field strength, and that has has to do with how the uh, RF waves get affected by the tissue. So they, the wavelength shortens, and that gives you spatial um, varying um, B, B, B1 profile. And you can um, exploit that to improve the uh, sensitivity. Now, of course, uh, you can overall get improved intrinsic SNR, but then when you actually image, you are also affected by T2 star and the T1. So the T2, T2 star or the decay rate, the decay time constant of the signal uh, changes, it shortens, and that uh, allows you to capture less signal. So that's resulting in uh, you capturing less signal. And the lengthening of the T1 also affects the signal. So if you go to 70 and beyond, uh, there is a supralinear increase in field strength, and that can be theoret theoretically demonstrated. So if the wavelength wouldn't get affected by the tissue, then it would be linear, but there's an extra factor from this wavelength effect. And that depends, that gain depends on where you are in, in the tissue or in the, in, the, in the object. And this is a uh, simulation that was performed by Larry Ward's group. And this assumes that you have ideal receiver coils, and that means that you have to have many, many elements, hundreds, 
and uh, different types of elements, dipoles and uh, coils, circular coils. And if you have the ideal coil, then you can see that the uh, SNR increases um, linearly in the in the periphery, more or less. But if you go in the deep side, in the deep within the, in the object, it goes super linearly. And especially above 9.4, even above 70, it starts to deviate from linear. You can see that a little bit more clearly in these bottom two graphs where uh, this area is expanded or the, the vertical scale is expanded. So that, that's why it makes sense to go a little bit higher than 7 Tesla, although it's very hard to do. So what uh, the problem is with going to higher field, the uh, magnet weight and size get increased nonlinearly. So if you go from 70 to 11.70, the, um, the weight of the system goes from uh, 36 tons to 132 tons. And it's really a ma major uh, cost issue. And technically, it becomes more difficult to, to uh, manufacture this. So the current state of that is that um, we have currently uh, 11170 at field. So there is one in South Korea that is at field. And there is one at NEH that is not at field because we had a, a big crash a quench of the system that damaged it. And we ha still haven't recovered from that. Um, there is another 1170 in France, and that has acquired its first images. So just going to 70 and uh, uh, developing these multi-channel coils, uh, you can improve SNR dramatically. So each of them has a factor of four approximately. So combined, that would be a factor of 16, but there's a, a little bit more increase because coils work better at high field. So you get an up to 25 volt improvement in, in sensitivity with these two developments. Now that's, that's great because now we can use that to improve the resolution. So the resolution, high resolution requires more SNR that goes pro approximately with the voxel volume. So uh, we can now go to about 0.5 millimeter resolution from, for NPRH as a T1 weighted contrast technique. So this can highlight uh, differences between gray and white matter. So uh, we get very good gray white matter contrast. The image is quite noisy and it takes 20 minutes. So that's not really clinical. If you can even scan even longer, just as a, for a demonstration purpose, you can get to to even higher resolution. So there is a data set on the internet uh, at an um, MPRH or T1 weighted scan at 0.25 millimeter resolution, collecting about eight hours worth of data. So they have a favorite subject that is willing to get, go in all night and they do eight one hour scans and average these. This is only possible if you do motion correction. So that's a critical technique to achieve uh, uh, this resolution with these very long scan times. But even uh, for 20 minutes and even less than that, motion correction is a very important technique to use with uh, high field MRI. And I'll show you a little bit of that later on. Contrast interpretation and man manipulation. So I'm gonna spend quite a bit of time of this and uh, primarily look at R2 star and, and T1. So uh, you only don't only get better resolution, but also the contrast changes at high field. And this can help you to reveal fine, fine detail in brain structure and pathology. But to really interpret that, we have to have, we have to really understand how this contrast that gets generated. And we have spent years on that. And with everything we find, we find also another complexity. So it, it has been quite a long process. Now, popular techniques at high fields for anatomical MRI are T1 weighted contrast and uh, T2 star contrast or susceptibility weighted imaging, uh, also called gradient echo imaging. And you can see that these two imaging techniques get very different contrast. So while MPRH gives primarily gray-white matter contrast, 
T2 star or susceptibility weighted MRI also gives contrast within tissue. And the gray white matter contrast is not as good as with MPRH. Now you see actually quite a bit of detail. One of the first things we noticed at NIH was that the, uh, within white matter, there is quite a bit of contrast that seems to be specific to fiber bonds, to the, to the different fiber bundles, or the, the major fiber bundles. And we found that the myelin density to some extent affects T2 star contrast more than it does into in an MPRH sequence. But what we also notice that if you look at um, at frequency, the frequency of the signal, uh, there is uh, much more contrast within tissue. So within white matter, you see some of the major fiber bundles uh, having very bright signal or uh, low frequency. So the frequency is actually flipped here. Dark is high frequency and uh, white is low frequency. And the line of Gennari or within cortex, you see quite a bit of contrast. Now, we, just a, a historical deal to how we got into this phase imaging, because I met Mark Hackey at one of the conferences, and he was doing SVI, the susceptibility weighted imaging. He's still doing that. But uh, he said, well, why don't you try it at 70? So the, we had one of the first 70s, and he had only a 3T, and he wanted me to do SVI at 3T or at 70. So I, I thought, okay, well, why not just try it? But for SVI, you need to multiply the magnitude signal with the phase, with a component of the phase signal. So you have to create a phase image. That's not typically what you do with a clinical scanner. So I, 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 I did that. And then I noticed there is a lot of stuff going on in the phase image, not just the vessels that Mark Hackey was interested in, but also within tissues, there is strong phase contrast. So that, that's why where we got into this phase imaging. Now, if you look at the magnitude and the phase of the signal, you see very different things. Um, usually you see more stuff in the phase. And a lot of the structures that you see stand out are uh, anatomical details. So for example, in this image, uh, the different labels give the different anatomical details. Optic radiations are major fibers that give very bright contrast. Uh, the mammalothalamic tract you can see here, usually very hard to see um, at 3T in magnitude or even 7T magnitude. So this is the magnitude image you see. See it barely, but in, in the face image you see it quite clearly. The basal ganglia uh, kind of distorted here, but if you look in the magnitude, they give very strong contrast with the globus pallidus being very dark. Uh, had it caught it and the putamen have also quite a bit of contrast. Mm -hmm. And then there is uh, vessels that stand out. So a lot of the veins here, for example, crossing the optic radiation, they are, uh, they, they are very apparent. Now to really interpret that, we have to check how, we, uh, how the signal is generated. So after you, in susceptibility weighted imaging, after you excite the signal, the signal evolves. And both the magnitude, uh, the magnitude varies over time. So if there is a decay time constant. And this um, signal decay is caused by tissue constituents at the subvoxel scale, primarily. So if you have uh, stuff in the tissue that disturbs the magnetization, you get different frequencies in the signal, and this phase incoherence or frequency difference causes um, decay of the magnitude signal. So you see also a frequency of the signal. This signal can also shift based on what is in the tissue. So both the the signal decay and the um, and the frequency contents give information about what is in the tissue. Now, one, once we have these two signals, the frequency and the magnitude of the signal, we can create different types of imaging images. You can just look at the magnitude at a certain time after the excitation or echo time. You can 
make an image of the decay time constant or decay rate. Here is the decay rate R2 star. So this is the decay rate in susceptibility weighted imaging. The phase by itself gives contrast, but you can reconstruct that phase into a measure of the tissue susceptibility, and that is shown on the right. And this is a very active area of research currently. So these are the things that you can make from the susceptibility weighted data. Now, how does the signal get affected by these different things in the tissue? So what, two of the major factors that affect the susceptibility weighted signal are iron and ferritin, and mostly, mostly iron in ferritin and myelin. So iron, is paramagnetic, it gets magnetized with the field. And its mechanism is because of an unparity electron. So the uh, the unpaired electron and its spinning create a field and that disturbs the susceptibility weighted signal, changes the frequency locally. Uh, then we have uh, myelin, it's diamagnetic, it gets magnetized against the field. And its effect comes from the electron orbit. So irony and ferritin is in some areas of the brain a major uh, contributor to the susceptibility weighted contrast, and particularly the uh, relaxation rate, R2 star. And uh, Brian Yao in my lab did measurements um, at different field strength and showed that this contrast increases linearly with field strength. And he derived um, a, a factor by which the R2 star gets affected per concentration of iron. So per ppm iron per Tesla, you get about 0.05 hertz or 0.05 per second change in the R2 star. Now, uh, to, to really see how iron and myelin contribute to R2 star across tissues, we did some tissue staining. Masaki Fukunaga did that. And if you compare the stains, you see that uh, some of the R2 star contrast appears to be caused by both iron and myelin. So the, both iron and myelin correlate highly with the R2 star. And you can see very clearly, for example, the uh, intracortical contrast in the uh, line of Gennari is both in the iron stain. So there's high iron in the line of Gennari, but there is also high myelin. And also subcortically, in the subcortical white matter, there's increased R2 star. There is also increased iron. Myelin, maybe not so much. So both iron and myelin correlate um, over this section. But it's not clear which one is dominating where and even which one is actually uh, contributing. It could be that myelin doesn't contribute at all if you just look at these, these images. If you do uh, an iron stain and look at higher resolution and compare it with very high resolution uh, susceptibility weighted imaging and look at the magnitude of the signal, you see also a very similar pattern. This is, yeah, whether this correlates or not is not uh, obviously clear or it's not, not like um, computationally clear because we didn't really correlate them. But, it, you know, from just looking at it, you see a speckle pattern at a, at a similar spatial scale in both images. And we have actually confirmed that there is higher iron uh, where, where the uh, magnitude drops out. Within the cortex, uh, to show that uh, we, whether iron or myelin contribute to the contrast, we did iron extraction. So Masaki Fugunaga used chemical extraction of iron in postmortem tissue and then pre-extraction measured susceptibility weighted contrast and post-extraction. And if you compare the two, you see that after extraction, the T2 star weighted contrast changes dramatically within the cortex. And this uh, line of Gennari darkness disappears after extraction in the magnitude signal. In the R2 star also, you see a reduction. Interestingly, in the frequency, this darkening disappears, and you see actually a slight brightness here, 
who have suggested myelin uh, contributes in an opposite manner to the frequency. And that makes sort of sense, you know, if you consider that iron is paramagnetic and myelin is diamagnetic. Now, deoxyhemoglobin is paramagnetic, and it can also contribute to uh, both magnitude and phase contrast. And in this excised hippocampus, it's very clear that there are uh, veins contributing to the both the magnitude and the phase contrast. Now, to really see whether uh, deoxyhemoglobin in vasculature contributes to phase contrast, it's particularly the gray-white matter contrast that we see in phase images. Um, Young ho Lee did an experiment on the rats where he used uh, myon particles, injected myon particles in the vasculature to see if that really affects gray-white matter contrast in the phase images. So before injection, you see some contrast, but it's quite modest. And then after injection, you see very strong contrast in particular between the vasculature and the tissue, but not so much between gray and white matter. You could think, well, gray matter has a higher blood volume. So, you know, if there is any um, contrast from deoxyhemoglobin, you would, you could get a difference between gray and white matter. But actually in the face images, that turns out not to be the case. In the Arthur star it does, but in the if you look at face, there's not really a big difference between gray and white matter. So this is great. This is before uh, and after injection. And you can see that the difference image in the bottom here don't really show a gray white matter difference. Now, major fibers are uh, quite interesting. Uh, so uh, if you look at iron and myelin stains, uh, the optic radiation has quite a bit of myelin, it's, it's quite dense in myelin, but iron is, is lacking. And then if you look at uh, the R2 star image, you see a strong, uh, a high R2 star in uh, the optic radiation. So that suggests that this major, major fiber contrast is not due to, due to iron, but maybe due to myelin. What you can also see is that uh, the subcortical white matter has a uh, high R2 star and it corresponds to high iron, but myelin seems to be normal. So, you know, very, there is a varying contribution of iron and myelin and their relative contribution to the R2 star contrast seems to be different in different tissues. Now, one thing that, that we thought of could cause that is that uh, in the major fiber bundles, there may be uh, different frequencies, di different frequency shifts in, in the in the microstructural compartments. So if you do an uh, if you rotate the tissue in the magnetic field, you see that both the frequency and the R to star change. So the bottom images are here R to star. You see a strong change in the R to star in different fiber bundles. So the different fiber bundles, or this is actually Marmoset, the different fiber bundles have different orientations. So this is a through plane fiber bundle in the corpus callosum and surrounding this central fiber bundle, there are transverse bundles that run within the plane. And you see that these different fiber bundles have different um, R2 star at a different orientation. So the central corpus callosum gets very bright here and that's when it's perpendicular to the B0 field. So increasing angle with the field causes the R2 star to increase. And similarly in the face, you see also strong differences between um, the different oriented fiber bundles. Now, an explanation of this is the microstructural compartment specific frequency shift. So microstructural compartment shapes are different in, in fiber bundles compared to gray matter. They're elongated fibers. And if you orient these fibers at different angles with the field, you get different frequencies within these fibers. And this was shown back in 1997 by um, Chris Bush's group and Roland Kreis, where they did spectroscopy on muscle fibers. And they found that if you rotate the muscle 
in the field, you get different spectra. So here on the left are the spectra. And they explain this that by um, stating that these um, different spectral uh, peaks come from different compartments in the muscle. So these are lipid signals. And the lipids in muscle can be in two different compartments. It can be intracellular uh, droplets that are spherical, or they can be surrounding the muscle fibers. The lipid can be surrounding muscle fibers, and then it's cylindrical. And they so show that if you have uh, a magnetization shift in a in a sphere sphere that gives a different field than a magnetization shift or a susceptibility difference uh, in a cylinder shape, and the difference is. Oh, the difference is uh, shown here. So it's the difference is the is the difference in susceptibilities between uh, lipids and water in this case times this factor over here. I, I'll, I'll explain that later why why it's that factor. Now, a famous paper of Yablonsky and Haki also showed this effect in the brain. They showed that the phase image depends on fiber rotation like we did, but they uh, gave an, um, a mathematical explanation for that, uh, for that uh, based on um, non-spherical Lorentzian cavities. It's, it's a mouthful, but um, it explains basically the same thing as Chris Bosch did in, in 1997. So to understand this, I'll go a little bit in depth. So we go back to a paper from John Schenk which showed that the field within uh, materials of different susceptibility is not um, just dependent on the susceptibility, but also on the shape of the object that you're looking at. For example, if you look in a sphere shown here, the field inside it, the magnetization is uniform, but the field inside it um, depends on the shape, the outer shape of this this particle. So if you have a sphere, it's different than in in an uh, ellipsoid perpendicular to field to the field or an ellipsoid parallel to the field. So the magnetization is that may be the same depending on the susceptibility of the material, but the field inside it is different, and that's because this magnetization has different effects on a sensor within this object, depending on uh, where that is. You have to convolve this magnetization distribution with the dipole effect of a uh, magnetiza magnetization, uh, a min minuscule magnetization, or an infinitesimal uh, small di dipole. Now, it turns out for spheres, this factor by which you have to change the magnetization to calculate the field is one third for spheres, and it's this term half sine square theta for ellipsoid. And this looks very similar to what Bo Bo Chris Bush found uh, over here, right? We have here also a third and a half sine square theta. Now, to to understand that for tissue, so in tissue we don't have a solid magnetization perturber, but we have uh, water protons surrounded by stuff. Now, if you look at water, there is so many water molecules within an MRI voxel that you can do quite a bit of averaging. If you, you have to average over all the sensors, which are uh, water protons, but you also have to average over their environments. So, if you do that, uh, you can see that a water molecule, each water molecule, so if you average all the environment of a water molecule and do that over all the water molecules or all the protons within a water molecule, you see that a proton is surrounded by a, a cavity, basically, because the other protons can not come very close because there is, they're all part of a water molecule, right? The proton has an oxygen and another proton of the on the other side. So there is some, some cavity. And even if you look at a single proton, there is always a, a certain distance from the sensor to its environment. So basically what the proton sees on average 
is a spherical surrounding, a spherical exclusion area where there is no other stuff, but only but the sensor location. Now, how do you cal calculate the magnetization if you have that kind of environment? Well, if you just have a solid magnetization perturber, the sh magnetization shift, um, uh, the, the field in the field shift is is two thirds of the magnetization, and that's because you have to subtract this um, the surface factor uh, for, from the uh, from the field. So there, this is a factor of one third. So you have to calculate the field based on all the dipoles that are around it. And if you do that for a, a solid sphere, you end up with only two thirds left of the magnetization of the of its effect on the field. So you have to subtract basically one third from the total magnetization. Now, if you do that for a sensor with an exclusion area, a spherical exclusion area, and then uh, a spherical surround uh, outer outer surface you can do that by just combining two of these so you have the same as here but then you subtract the center area of that and if you do that you end up with subtracting two-thirds from two-thirds and you end up with zero so you can understand that by um or, or simplify it by just looking at surfaces so if you want to calculate the field shift in the center here, you'd have to consider a factor of this surface and a, and a factor of that surface and the magnetization difference around this surface area. And that ends up to be uh, the magnetization outside the exclusion zone minus the magnetization inside, which is, that's a factor of M, so M minus zero, and then times the, surf, the, the surface correction factor alpha, which is um, one third. And then you do the same here um for the outer surface so the difference is now zero minus m and the same factor and it ends up to be zero so in in white matter fibers it's a little bit different because you have not just spherical surfaces but you have also um elongated or elongated ellipsoids or maybe even cylinders or infinite cylinders they're not quite infinite but very long elongated uh, ellipsoids and you do the same thing here. So you take for each. So if you want to calculate the field inside this um, in this spherical uh, area inside the fiber, you have to look at all the uh, magnetization transitions. And you first have the exclusion zone from this uh, so-called Lorentzian sphere where the proton is uh, resides. You have all the water molecules around it that have a certain susceptibility. Then you have some susceptibility within the fiber. Um, you have susceptibility of the myelin, and then you have outside the, the fiber. So all these transitions you have to take into account when you calculate the frequency shift in the center. And when you do that, uh, you get these equations for inside the fiber, and you get this for outside the fiber. If you take the difference of that, you get this, this same factor as Chris Bosch found. Now, to this was a very strong, very strong simplification because we looked at like an ellipsoidal uh, fiber and a, a spherical, uh, a spherical um, center, you know, and the surrounding the water proton. But uh, yeah, in general, tissue is very complex, and there is many, many water protons. Ten to the whatever. Uh, 22 or so of which maybe 10 to the 17th are aligned with the field and all these protons they diffuse over many proton distances so there is a lot of signal averaging not only over the protons but also over their environments and there is time averaging with each within each um, uh, sample of the uh, mr signal so if you want to calculate the effect of all that this all complex stuff uh, that you can simplify that by looking at the average uh, magnetic environment or the actually the structural autocorrelation of the tissue so you look at all the magnetization perturbers and then you calculate the distribution of that and you do the structural autocorrelation of that that's this uh, equation 
And then the frequency shift can be deduced from that. And this was very elegantly described by uh, Valerie Kiselev uh, a few years ago, and he has some extra additional papers to look at special circumstances and include the diffusion effect. Um, I discussed this adequately, I think. Now, next thing we found, how, how am I doing on time? Let's see. Uh, another 15 minutes. I'll, I'll go, I'll skip over some stuff. So one uh, interesting we found is that there are frequency uh, variations over the echo time. Um, so there is a multi-component relaxation going on in white matter, but not only the magnitude varies, but also the frequencies uh, of the signal. Um, if you do a, a multi-exponential fit to the signal, or actually if you first do a single exponential fit to the T2 star decay, um, you find that the uh, the um, the error in the fit has an, a sinusoidal or an oscillatory component. So this is the, the fit residue. And that um, fit residue gets stronger at high field at 70 compared to 3T. Now, having that in mind that there is this oscillatory residue and uh, the paper that just came out at the time by Chen Lu that suggested that the magnetic susceptibility in white matter could be anisotropic, um, we analyze this in more in detail and we simulate anisotropic uh, susceptibility of myelin and what effect that would have on the resonance frequency in a tissue like white matter. So we took parallel cyl cylinders, parallel and perpendicular to the magnetic field. And we found that within the fiber, within these uh, white matter fibers and outside the fibers, the frequency is different. And also within the myelin, it's, it's different again. So if you compare these frequencies, they're quite shifted uh, for fibers perpendicular to fields, but not for parallel to the fields. And when you have just an uh, isotropic susceptibility, so a susceptibility that is independent of the field direction, you don't get this frequency shift. So frequency shifts that we apparently observe um, from these uh, from this uh, single exponential fit residue seem to be uh, created by anisotropic susceptibility. And uh, Richard Botel's group nicely demonstrated that also mathematically that you have different frequency shift within the um, axon and outside the axon, depending on uh, whether the susceptibility is isotropic or anisotropic. So uh, in, oops, what happened? Okay. Um, if you look inside the fiber with isotropic susceptibility, uh, the frequency is shifted at zero, but it has a value here that depends on the myelin thickness. Outside the cylinder, it's uh, uh, circumferentially dependent, but uh, it averages also to zero. Uh, this goes too far. You have to uh, integrate over uh, 360 degrees. So this average to zero for isotropic susceptibility, but not for um, uh, actually, also for uh, anisotropic susceptibility, but the, the main difference is this term here. So the frequency shift actually from anisotropic susceptibility outside the, uh, the fiber is zero, the average one, but there is a field distribution and this affects the T2 star, not just the frequency shift by itself. And then if you do, uh, if you analyze the data based on this model, you find a very good correspondence to the model predicted decay rate, uh, or to start decay rate and the uh, frequency shift. And furthermore, the frequency shift that you find is now echo time dependent. So you have to be really careful by, uh, with interpreting frequency shift in white matter fibers. Now, to really demonstrate that or prove that it's really the anisotropic susceptibility that causes frequency shifts, Young Ho Lee did a very uh, nice experiment where he took a spinal cord uh, 
fiber of spinal cord white matter and cut that in uh, in, in a, a cylinder or in a rectangle rectangular cylinder and then cut cubes out of that and then after he cut that he either arranged them in the original orientation in the original fiber orientation or he rotated them by 90 degrees um that can be seen by the DTI then an orientation image. If you look at the magnitude, it doesn't really is not really affected by this orientation. But um, if you look at the frequency, you see that both the frequency inside and especially outside is changed uh, when you rotate these uh, these segments, and that proves that it is an anisotropic susceptibility or the susceptibility itself that causes this uh, effect. Another this demonstration that we did for that is looking at uh, orienting effect. So if you have anisotropic susceptibility, uh, and in this case a vesicle with anisotropic susceptibility, it will orient itself in the magnetic field. This was shown a long time ago, and has also been shown for retinal rods, red blood cells, and muscle fibers. So we thought to do that also in spinal cord, and we could demonstrate that spinal cord orient also orient itself in the magnetic field. So the, this explains the frequency what, uh, effects of anisotropic susceptibility, but for R2 star, it's a little bit more complicated. And uh, Botel's group showed that R2 star changes in white matter fibers may be more caused by compartmentalization effects themselves rather than the susceptibility being anisotropic. Although that conclusion is is that is is a little bit complicated, it will depend on the um, on diffusion in 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 this inhomogeneous field outside the fiber. So, in summary, in the different tissue compartments, we have different things contributing most strongly to uh, the contrast. And this is summarized over here in fiber bundles. This is very complicated because not only tissue constituents, but also their microstructural distribution and orientation affects the contrast. The take home message from, is, uh, from that is that if you want to do quantitative susceptibility mapping, so derive the susceptibility of the tissue from, from the signal, you have to account for the TE dependence of the frequency. And you, you may also have to do um, correct for the orientation of the fiber because of this compartmentalization effect on the frequencies. So we have worked with uh, several people at NIH to look at clinical applications of susceptibility weighted MRI and also T1 weighted MRI. Um, with um, Francesco Bagnato and Danny Reich, we have worked on MS and with um, just in Kwan, we have to, in Mary K. Floater, we have to look at ALS, and I'll show you some example of that. But before I do that, uh, I want to emphasize that it is important to correct for motion, uh, not just uh, head motion, but also respiration. And uh, respiration, both has respiration and head motion cause encoding artifacts, but also um, they change the field. And these field disturbances with motion and with respiration affect image quality. And both need to be corrected. So, so the encoding artifact as well as the field change have to be corrected to, um, to you know, to really resolve these motion issues. And when you do that, you can see that there is an improved visualization of, of, um, of small details. One of the first things that we saw in MS is that um, many lesions are traversed by veins, and that is particularly apparent if you do high resolution. So the susceptibility imaging at high field allows you 0.2 in-plane resolution. And uh, that then suddenly you see that almost every vein, every lesion is traversed by a vein. Well, that's maybe a little bit exaggerated, but I would say at least half of them you will see vein, especially clo those close to the ventricles. They they're almost always traversed by a vein. 
Also, uh, lesions often have a rim around them, and we call them ring lesions. And this is often caused by iron. Sometimes there are some vessels around lesions, but typically uh, this is iron. And we have demonstrated that by doing histology. Now, why that iron is there is not clear. Uh, we have some, some done some work on that. But often that iron is also seen within lesions, uh, not just in the periphery of, or the surround of a lesion, but also within lesions. There is heterogeneity that appears to be partly caused by iron, uh, iron differences. High resolution allows you also to see cortical lesions and maybe not always more clearly with susceptibility weight MRI, but the combination of T1 and susceptibility weighted MRI allows you to capture a great many uh, cortical lesions. So I think a large fraction of the cortical lesions can be captured that way. Although, of course, there is a, a sliding scale of what uh, the, the size of the cortical lesions, they can be very small and then escape detection, but there may be still substantial cortical pathology that way. Some of the uh, uh, apparent uh, iron around lesions occurs when lesions are um, open, to, when they have an open blood brain barrier. So that sort of signifies an active lesion. So some of the iron in lesions that shows up in susceptibility weighted MRI may reflect an active lesion, but definitely not always. So um, the iron is thought to accumulate when repair processes uh, of myelin loss, typical for MS, uh, occur. So the, to regenerate the, uh, the myelin, iron is needed. It's a precursor for myelin generation. So the the microglia start to absorb more iron and then use it for regeneration. But um, regeneration can be successful and or not successful. But in both cases, there can be an iron iron accumulation. So the accumulated iron doesn't really always disappear from the tissue. It can remain there. So both in active lesions or active remyelinating lesions, you can have increased iron, but also in uh, lesions where myelin is gone and, and the chronic lesions, you can still have remaining iron. In ILS, you see also iron accumulation and primarily in the motor, motor cortex, and that can be confirmed with iron stains. So the increase in R2 star is, occurs in layers that also have high iron in the, in the staining. Uh, other areas in ILS also have increased iron, so motor cortex is just one of them. And if in some variants of ALS, these iron distribution changes affect the progression of the disease. So from the spatial distribution of the iron, you could maybe uh, gauge at, uh, at what stage the disease is. Now, I'll, I have a few more minutes, I guess, and I'll just quickly show some recent work that we have to, um, to try to see how we can maybe make the high field MRI signal more specific to iron and myelin, because as I showed you, often both iron and myelin contribute to susceptibility, susceptibility weighted contrast. Well, first of all, you, you would probably you, you would need to do DTI corrected QSM and R2 star measurement because you know the fiber orientation affects the contrast in both these contrasts. Now, if you have the QSM and the R2 star, what you could do is uh, the method of chi separation that was uh, recently introduced by the group of Young Ho Lee. And this allows you to distinguish between the effect of iron and myelin through their different effects on the R2 star and the susceptibility, because both iron and myelin increase R2 star, but they have opposing effects on the susceptibility, paramagnetic versus diamagnetic. So if you, you apply that with some assumptions, of course, you can uh, distinguish between the positive effects on chi uh, from the iron uh, over here, sorry, over here, and the negative effect of myelin. So th then you can uh, deduce whether an R2 star increase that you see is uh, or an R2 star reduction that you see is due to iron or myelin changes or a QSM changes due to 
iron or myelin changes. Now, this sort of this slide sort of summarizes the effect of iron and myelin on the different contrast. And unfortunately, both iron and myelin have substantial effect on R2 star and chi. Uh, you have to re realize that even gray matter in, in areas with fairly low iron, there is still about 40 ppm of iron, and it can go up to 200. So these, the frequency shift that that causes is not so different from what myelin causes, or not the frequency, the R2 star change. This is in, in per seconds per ppm. Um, at seven tesla, in chi, similarly, both iron and mining can cause similar effects of about 0.1 ppm on the susceptibility. And notably, R1 um, myelin has a much stronger effect, so about 0.4 per second uh, for it iron, 0.001 per second per ppm. So R R1 is rather specific to myelin. Interestingly, at high field, myelin causes a non-single exponential T1, just like we see to, saw with the T2 star. Also, T1 becomes non-exponential, especially going from 30 to 70, this effect gets much stronger. And furthermore, it depends really on the um, excitation or inversion pulse that you use. So depending on the power in the pulse, you get different uh, a relaxation rate or a different non exponentiality. So the short component particularly gets very strong if you have a, an inversion pulse with low power. So these are uh, lo, uh, high power and this is a lower power pulse. And the explanation for that is that the initial part of the T1 decay is caused by the magnetization difference between myelin protons and water protons. And this magnetization difference is high when you give a low power pulse uh, because the myelin protons get minimally saturated, whereas the water protons get inverted. So you have a diff big magnetization difference. And what you then get is an exchange between a tuple exchange that causes an evolution of the decay and a variable T1. So to uh, investigated, we did a saturation recovery experiment. This is really a classical experiment where we give an actually a saturation pulse in this case, not an inversion pulse. And we saturate the myelin protons and then we look after a certain time what effect that has on the water signal. So that requires an exchange between the myelin proton magnetization and the water proton magnetization. Now, if you do that at different delay, delay times, you see a different effect um, on the um, magnetization. And the strongest effect is around 200 milliseconds. And that is an equilibrium point between the exchange of uh, the magnetization from the myelin protons to the water protons and the decay of the uh, water protons. The T1 decay of the water protons. So if you look at the difference between 3T and 70, you see that the effect is much stronger at 70. And we have attributed that to an increased R1 from the myelin proton. So it turns out that uh, myelin protons uh, increase that to, uh, T1 substantially. So this is um, a different field strength. And you see that the R1 of the myelin protons increases, ra decreases rapidly with field strength giving them more opportunity to exchange their magnetization with the water protons. And that's why you get a much stronger signal at 70. And that's in addition to the normal sensitivity increases. If you model that with this two more pool model of exchange, then you can end up with a similar um, myelin proton fraction for both 70 and, and 3T. So this is a way to look at myelin in a quantitative way, although you sacrifice resolution because of all these uh, saturation effects and, and modeling. And so th this might not be applicable to small changes in lesions like MS, small MS lesions. Another interesting thing that we have been thinking about is T2 at high field. So 
people don't like to do T2 at high film because it's very difficult to get pure T2 effects or even what what T2 means at high field because of the effects of susceptibility and diffusion on the T2 time constant. So this is a little different than uh, T2 star. It is the refocusable transverse uh, uh, magnetization decay. Now, paper in 1993 showed that if you compare T2 at 1.5 or 0 0.5 and 1.5 T, you find that the R2 increases strongest in areas that have high iron. So global spellers, you get a very big jump in, in T2, but areas where iron is not so high and maybe like uh, white matter, the jump is, is much smaller. And he showed that this jump correlates with tissue iron content. Now, if you make a T2 image at 70, and this is done in, in, in a bit of a special way, um, I will go, won't go into depth on that, but if you look at the T2 distribution and the iron distribution, you see that there is quite a striking similarity. So there is high iron basal ganglia caught it in putamen, also the pulvinar of the thalamus. And then very strikingly, you see also in the cortex, the occipital cortex, you see increased um, T2. Uh, where you also see increased iron versus the uh, subcortical white matter. And in the frontal lobe, this is reversed. This is actually a phenomenon that Peter van Zyl's group showed in uh, many years back on, at 1.5 T. But the, the thing, the idea is that at 70, this jump becomes much stronger, the jump in, our, in T2, and making the T2 less dependent on other stuff in the tissue. So the, I'll summarize now, and uh, I want to say I want to say that uh, 70 reveal, reveals my fine brain structure and lesion detail that is hard to see at 3T. If you look back at 70 at 3T, when you have seen the 70, you can often find the same structures, but you wouldn't have seen them just looking at the 3T data. Susceptibility weighted MRI at high field is particularly sensitive and allows 0.3 mm millimeter resolution and seems clinically feasible when you include motion correction. Um, both iron and myelin contribute to the susceptibility weight MRI contrast. In some areas, one may generally dominate uh, versus the other. So it's, it becomes brain area specific or dependent. Microstructural orientation effects complicate quantification of iron and myelin and also of QSM. They need to be accounted for. Quantification is possible. Quantification of susceptibility weighted MRI is possible when you include information from the diffusion weight MRI to compensate for the orientation effects. But this also sacrifices a bit of resolution. Um, and simpler quantification may be possible if we look at T1 or T2 contrast, but that remains to be uh, determined and likely will also reduce resolution. I just want to um, thank all my contributors and collaborators uh, that have worked on, on you know, getting, getting this research done and coming with ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jeff. This is amazing talk as usual. Um, we're getting questions already through the Q and A uh, box. Can you see it, or should I read it to you? Uh, let me see. Yeah, on, on the yeah, bottom. I see, I see it. I see it. Okay. I see. Okay. Great. Um, Shall I go also, one? Uh, yeah, Doctor Van Zyl is here, so he can ask uh, you questions as well. Uh, I'll I'll go from the first one. Peter asked the effect of saturation on T1 is basically the classic semi-solid MT effect. Aren't you just doing a post-MT experiment with different saturation levels? Um, yeah. Uh, the classic same. <laughs> not sure what, what you mean here. Um, so pulse MT, you mean this is what we do here is a single pulse MT experiment where we put all the saturation effects into one pulse, making it easier to interpret the time dependent 
and T effect. Um, yeah, but that's the same thing, isn't it, Jeff? So normally when you give an RF pulse and if it's a non-selective pulse, then you deface the semi-solid right away because of yeah. the microsecond uh, T2 star or T2. And uh, what you're doing is basically that, isn't it? So what is different from an MT experiment? So, so that's oh, so why the M you also the MT see the pylon. Uh, so the MT experiment, what people typically do, well, first of all, they what people do a lot is continuous pulses or long pulses. And then during the pulse, you get a transfer of magnetization. So you you keep uh, hitting both the water and, and, the, and the myelin. And when people do pulse, they usually do multiple pulses within the T1 of the water. Right, so it gets really complicated. So in in, uh, in this case, if you do the saturation recovery, we don't really do. We only one time create a difference between the semi solid and the water, and then don't then nothing else affect that. So it's easier to to quantify. It's just a steady state experiment, isn't it? So the pulsed MT is also like steady state. No, it's not steady state. It's we let, we wait like six seconds after a single pulse yeah yeah so okay but it's, it's still just the MT effect yeah yeah it's still the just the all right yeah, yeah. right so uh, John Gore's group also did this with an inversion pulse so inversion recovery and then do the two pool exchange model on that so that's sort of also an MT experiment but the problem with that is that the inversion pulse uh, has an unclear effect on the myelin on the on the semi-solid pool right because it depends on the power of the inversion pulse what happens with the semi-solid pool so the way we did it we just give a very high power or well it doesn't even have to that high it's like an eight millisecond 100 hertz v1 pulse more or less and that saturates everything uh, of the semi-solid and so then you can start with the MZ equals zero for that pool, and you don't have to fit that. Makes the things uh, easier. Yeah. You don't okay. seem convinced. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about it later. <laughs> I'll see I'm you. Saying, yeah. I'm not saying this is the only only way to do it, but uh, you know it just shows that you know you may be able to quantify um, in a, in a straightforward way the uh, the myelin concentration. Mm. Okay. Uh, Lin Chen asks, when we detect the myelin and iron, whatever model used, like cylinder or sphere models in phase and frequency, map, do you think non-local effects make large difference? um non-local effects i'm not sure what is lin chen uh, here or can he i can uh, i can uh, i can uh, ask her um, to talk give me one second well she probably means you normally have to deconvolve the effect of all the surrounding uh, dipoles like in qsm i'm not sure that's what she means but uh... Yes, yes. Uh, I mean that uh, when we calcul calculate the stabilities, uh, we will uh, in include the neighboring uh, work source effect, uh, like the partial mm. volume effect. Ah. Yeah, that's so. All, all, everything what I showed is um, subvoxel structure. Now, yeah. you, yeah, so you, the image. The imaging process also, um, yeah, gives a complication to how the face wraps into the how the, the object face wraps into the single voxel. There is a small imaging component as well, uh, but you know, uh, macroscopic things. So my, with macroscopic, I mean above voxel size scale. Those a lot of those things get corrected because you have the signal from all the voxels, right? So you you can calculate the correction for from those from the neighboring voxels. But there is some 
like intermediate effect on the way subvoxel scale to the around voxel uh, voxel scale that that also affect the calculation and um there is a recent paper by Kiselev, Ru and Kiselev. I'm not sure if it's out, but I was a reviewer on that, and I, I think it got accepted, and that that uh, includes that that um, as well. But I don't think that is a big factor. That's fairly straightforward. Okay, the third question: uh, Does T two contrast at seventy also show orientation dependence? Yes, because of the diffusion. So there is diffusion effect in field gradients or field frequency differences between uh, around the fibers, right? Around the fibers, there is a frequency distribution and between or within the fiber, water within the fiber versus water outside the fiber has also a frequency difference. The strongest effect is I think around the fiber, uh, but you know, the, the, the those are all several micron scale effects so this is definitely an, an important factor because diffusion is maybe on average a micron squared per millisecond so if you have 20 milliseconds it's uh, four to five micron and that's about the size of the frequency distribution right so there is a an um, frequency distribution around the fiber that was uh, modeled by um, Botel. But even with isotropic, both isotropic and anisotropic susceptibility have that frequency distribution. And diffusion in that makes a difference. So yes, depending on echo spacing, you get different contrasts. And also depending on um, fiber orientation, you expect different contrasts. OK, next talk, next question. Given your experience with iron myelin at high field, are you able to distinguish between different subthalamic nuclei at high field? Yeah, uh, you can see definitely uh, nuclei in the thalamus. Marta Bianciardi at MGH has a paper on that. Uh, we haven't really focused on that. So yes, uh, it's quite interesting. Even brainstem nuclei you can uh, distinguish, but I don't think it's in brainstem, it's not that robust. Depending, of course, which nuclei you're talking about, there is many different nuclei with different di different sizes and different contrasts. But some of the major ones, maybe uh, um, locus, cerule locus ceruleus, maybe I don't. Know, I'm not sure what are the most robust ones. Does saturation pulse for the T1 experiment have differential effects depending on shin homogeneity? um yeah there is a bit of of resonance sensitivity um so that depends on the bandwidth of the pulse um so bandwidth is usually kilohertz or so um i think it's small uh, the biggest effect is uh b1 uniformity it's way bigger than any shim effect. So, yeah, is or is the pulse broadband enough that it doesn't matter? So, yeah, the, it's about a kilohertz. So, yeah, there is a, some a subtle effect, but it's it's not very big. Thanks for a great talk. I wonder how we can think about diffusion effects on susceptibility contrast, R2 star or frequency. Uh, in brain, do you think diffusion is big enough to affect contrast? Definitely in light matter fiber bundles, just like the T2, it has effect on the on the R2 star as well. Yes. So the answer is yes. <laughs> um, and another question came. B1. B1 plus and PTX benefits. Well, Ravi Menon asked, that was my next question, B1 plus and PTX benefits. I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> Can people ask questions also through the microphone or? So? I, yeah, so they, uh, 
I can allow them to talk. Uh, just give me. Maybe ask uh, Rafi what he means by his question. Yes, he's here. In the meantime, I'll answer the next question. What might be the best echo time for Jerry? Sorry, wait, can you, sorry. Can you hear uh, me, Jeff? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so what I was asking, Jeff, uh, this is Ravi, is um, regarding, again, the saturation effect. I mean, B1 plus in homogeneity is pretty large at 7T. So you're going to get variable saturation across ah. the volume. Yeah, yeah, OK. So you mean for the empty experiment? Yes. Oh, OK, yeah. Th so that's why we do this uh, uh, high power pulse. So we saturate everything. Uh, we we over, over saturate, let's say. So if the B1 is low in some spots, it will still uh, kill off all the myelin magnetization. OK, so you're just, OK. So um, with the, with the you don't run into this. Harder, with the inversion pulse, it's harder because you have both of resonance and B1 uniformity issues, and that affects the the inversion or the saturation. Yeah, yeah. But, but I mean, I'm a fan that, of the saturation. Yeah. So with with a Experiment. with a saturation pulse, it's it's a lot easier. Yes, and you actually affect more water molecules, I think, because if you have a good exchange time, so. Yeah, so in in principle, you could do better with an inversion pulse because, you know, you can leave the um, myelin magnetization intact and invert the the water one water magnetization. So then you have a, a two difference instead of a one and z difference, right? So, but but it's very hard to give a very low power inversion pulse that doesn't affect the. A myelin proton. So in general, it always affects it. And furthermore, it becomes variable, right? Variable with the uh, B1 amplitude and the uh, of resonance. So it's it's really tricky to do that. But yeah, in principle, you can get even better with an uh, inversion pulse. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, then the last question is: What might be the best echo time of GRE? So we did. Uh, you have to be at the T2 star of the tissue to get to optimal SNR, both for the phase contrast as well as the magnitude contrast. So at um, 70, that's around 30 milliseconds for gray and white matter. Um, so yeah, the echo time. And so we, in our initial experiment, we acquired for a long time as well. So maybe um, 30 milliseconds acquisition time around the 30 millisecond echo time so to get as much signal as possible uh, so we haven't really looked at uh, gray uh, lesion lesions in ms what is the optimal time but we generally try to capture as much signal as possible around the echo time of 30 milliseconds Okay, great. I think that's all the questions from the Q&A box. And uh, uh, if no more questions, let's uh, thank uh, Jeff again for this amazing talk as always. Jeff, I can tell you we have the, I guess one of the highest attendance for this lecture series today. And uh, I guess most- I'm famous. Uh, <laughs> so thank you so much uh, for, doing, for doing this. Uh, especially, you know, people are recovering from Labor Day now weekend. I see. And now they have to recover from my talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Jeff, again. Uh, thank you so much, everybody. We'll see you uh, next month.